Good evening and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Betty Yu and I am a reporter with KPIX5 CBS San Francisco. I joined in November 2013 and over the past year I have seen and covered the effects of COVID day to day. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, I'm glad to be here with all of you to cover this good news story about how China-based donors and their international partners have really helped U.S. hospitals fight this pandemic. We have participants joining us this evening from all around the world, including China, so a special welcome to all of you. This program is one in a series of good news stories from the Asia-Pacific Affairs Forum, chaired by Ian McQuaig. Thank you, Ian, for having me here this evening. And this event is being recorded and live streamed on the Commonwealth Club's YouTube channel and will also be available for download later on at commonwealthclub.org. So thank you all for joining us. We encourage you also to become a member of this club and to learn more about it, you can just go to their website. So welcome everybody to our panel this evening. While I've reported on a wide variety of COVID-19 stories in this past year. I'm really happy to be here with you to moderate this panel of a good news story about how China-based donors and international partners have really helped in this fight during the pandemic. Today's panelists bring together for-profit and non-profit organizations in China and the United States, and they're working seamlessly together to help supply U.S.-based hospitals with urgently needed PPE, personal protective equipment. Our specific example brings together the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, that's San Francisco's sister city, which worked with China-based financial donors and suppliers, partnered with Flex, uh, flexport.org for free shipping and with MedShare International for export-import assistance, and ultimately delivered 20,000 top quality surgical masks to San Francisco's own Chinese hospital on Jackson Street. Similar sorts of partnerships help deliver millions of PPE from China to the United States. We have five panelists here with us to help us tell their story. First up, Eric Talbert. Hello, Eric. Hi, Betty. He is an, an instructor at San Francisco State's University's nonprofit management program and helped link all of these groups together. David Basmijan. Hello, David. Hi, Betty. You are the governor of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai and helped lead the chamber's efforts to get PPE from China to the U.S. Dave Hartman. Hello, Dave. Hey, Betty. Nice to be here with you. Nice to have you. Dave is with Flexport.org, which describes itself as the operating system for delivering global aid. And you arrange for AmCham Shanghai's PPE donation to be picked up at the factory in China and then delivered to the doorstep of Chinese Hospital, their main campus on Jackson Street here in San Francisco. Jason Chernock. Hi, Jason. Hi, Betty. Nice to be here. Nice to have you. Jason is with MedShare International. He provided export-import assistance to facilitate AmCham's donation to Chinese Hospital, as well as provided Chinese Hospital's first and second biggest PPE donation. And finally, Dr. Dan Zhang with Chinese Hospital CEO. You used more than 380 donations of 730,000 PPE to prevent a COVID-19 pandemic outbreak here in San Francisco's Chinatown. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for being here with us. So we'll have five minutes with each of you, but before we jump in, just a reminder that if you have any questions for our panelists, that to post them in the YouTube chat box, those questions will then be forwarded to me throughout this program. So let's begin. We'll begin with Eric Talbert. He teaches at San Francisco State University in the nonprofit management program. He also has more than 15 years of nonprofit leadership experience with a focus on advancing human rights locally and globally. And in his former role at MedShare, Eric drew together nonprofit healthcare organizations with much needed PPE, free shipping via Flexport as well as import assistance. Eric, as former Western Regional Director of MedShare, you worked with Flexport.org to help provide free shipping for the massive amounts of PPE that were needed and medical goods that MedShare sends around the world. Can you tell us how you learned of the needs of PPE at the Chinese hospital and how you help them connect donated goods from China with free shipping and import assistance? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Betty. It's definitely a team effort. Um, I also want to take a moment just to thank you, Betty, for moderating uh, and for all your dedication throughout your career to have these positive news stories, um, especially during this difficult year, because um, your stories help us remind us that we can all do something. Um, and by doing uh, so, we will get through this together. So thank you, Betty. I also just want to take a quick moment to thank Adam, Arnav, Mark, and Spencer for all their help this week and for their work behind the scenes on the production team of the Commonwealth Club. And of course, just another shout out and appreciation to Ian uh, for organizing us and getting us all together so we can have this conversation today. It's truly an, an honor uh, for me to be a member of this panel. Uh, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to thank all of you again uh, for stepping up and for helping out um, this, creating these impactful partnerships. Uh, what you've done to help frontline healthcare professionals as well as increase care uh, for people in our community. You know, and as I re reflect on these um, life-saving partnerships and take a moment to celebrate what we've accomplished together, uh, I also want to encourage us to continue to deepen our relationships and build new partnerships. The, the road ahead is unfinished, uh, so we must remain collaborative and agile as we work together to expand health equity. Uh, and so to your question, Betty, you know, I learned about the needs of PPE at Chinese Hospital as part of several conversations I was having uh, in January, February of, of 2020. Uh, feels so long ago, uh, but just last year. And these conversations were with several trusted community health care partners. Uh, they included women uh, and homeless shelters in the East Bay, the Network of San Francisco Free Clinics, Laguna Honda Hospital, UCSF, and Health Right 360. Part of what was so unique about the partnership with the Chinese hospital is that it was a full reversal of a vital supply chain in a short amount of time. Um, and some of us luckily were already working together to get PPE to hospitals and frontline healthcare workers in Wuhan and Shanghai uh, early in the, in the pandemic. And then we had to, uh, what felt like a very quick flip of the switch um, reverse those phone calls uh, to be able to get the needs uh, from Shanghai and other parts of China, this PPE that was so valuable that we all know uh, the acronym now, uh, to Chinese hospitals. You said right here on Jackson Street in the heart of San Francisco's Chinatown. Um, and I would say, you know, because trust finds the trustworthy, uh, these partners did what it took to save lives early on. Um, and since high quality healthcare is a basic human right, has always been important to reach out and build trust with these established community-based healthcare partners um, who have created and developed the relationships like they've done at Chinese Hospital to take care of the most vulnerable members of their communities as part of our community at large. Um, you know, and these partnerships are based in human rights rather than business and, and profits. So we're focused on equity. And the goal was to provide as many existing trusted partners with this high quality PPE that they requested um, so that our collective uh, capabilities could significantly improve our overall uh, capabilities. So that capacity that we had rolled into that to improve our capabilities to protect the frontline healthcare workers. Um, and I also feel when just, you know, thinking about this partnership uh, and, and where we're at here a year later, I also feel it's important to share that we have much to learn from the cascading failures of support that weren't provided for, uh, but should have been. And you know, some of us who've been doing this for a while, we looked to and had conversations about the recent history of the HIV AIDS crisis uh, and what we can learn from that, um, especially as we saw early on and now we're all, we are all too familiar with the, the toxic ways of treating each other are still deeply with us and the structural racism and the ableism in our society that had forced a disproportionate burden of COVID cases and deaths to be shouldered by black, indigenous and people of, of color is unjust. And so these partnerships are part of what help us overcome that. Um, and I still know there's issues uh, I've been reading about, you know, the intellectual property uh, and the greed that persists as obstacles to the equitable COVID vaccine production, as well as access worldwide. Uh, there's still a need for people's vaccine as a step towards uh, one step towards ending uh, this medical apartheid locally and globally. And I was talking to a friend of mine recently as Professor Stephen Thrasher, and he reminded me that COVID is just one of 20 current pandemics happening in the world. And so wow. 
and he highlights this, he's got a book coming out called The uh, Viral Underclass. So we have much to do to improve health equity. But part of why I'm so optimistic, despite these really intense challenges that we're all familiar with and work to overcome every day, is because of these partnerships. And we proved what we can do when we work together. And it's so important to me, and it's such an honor to be here to be able to share this story. Um, and another example to kind of bring it back to the, to the panel here uh, is with my current work uh, with the Nepal Youth Foundation, I started calling around just a couple months ago about getting vaccines for my colleagues in Kathmandu, frontline healthcare workers, childcare workers. And I was told in early January, you know, maybe we'll have some by 2024. Unacceptable, kept making phone calls, kept emailing folks in a couple of weeks. I was told, okay, maybe 2022. And I, Right. It's like, okay, progress. I'm going to keep at it. And then my colleague, Sam, uh, called me from Kathmandu two weeks later and said, vaccines are on the way. And our, our colleagues will be vaccinated in, in, th in three days. Uh, this donation was coming from India. It was a huge relief. But of course, my concern was, okay, well, what about everybody else? And Sam said, don't worry, there's more coming from China. Right. So there's more, more vaccines. And to think about that and how we need to work together globally to really address and solve this issue. And that's what the people on this panel really embraced early on and continue to do um, form these partnerships. Um, oh, so I really I also, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to wrap up here because I'm going to bring it back to and try to set up my, my panelists here. Uh, you know, the quick personal story that it comes to my mind when I was thinking about this is, you know, I was asked numerous times early on when we were shipping PPE to China at the onset of COVID, and it was a very intense, and I really empathized with this question. And this, it was like, what, what if we ended up needing those supplies here in the United States and California? And this question kept coming up over and over again. And I understood the concerns that folks had, why they were asking. And my ask to them was to not give in to that fear. Because when outbreaks happen, the most effective global health response is to do what we can to support the people at the point of outbreak. I then asked them to trust that if we needed PPE in the United States, that donations would soon start flowing from China. Uh, and thanks to the courage and the kindness of the people on this panel, as well as the, the courage of the leadership within these organizations they represent, that is exactly what began to happen just over a year ago. Thank you so much. I know you highlighted that it takes a partnership to make all of this happen, and it definitely was not an easy feat. I want to bring in our next panelist, David Besmejian. He's a senior advisor for public affairs at Takeda Pharmaceuticals and served as a member of the Board of Governors at the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. David was instrumental in bringing overseas support from China to many nonprofit organizations here in the United States, including the Chinese hospital. David, what objectives did AmCham have in terms of getting that PPE from China to the United States? And then how did you become familiar with the needs of Chinese hospital here in San Francisco? Hi, Betty. Thanks a lot for uh, the question. And I just wanted to thank the Commonwealth Club for having me today and inviting AmCham Shanghai to, to tell this story. Uh, as Eric said, it, it really is an interesting one. And um, I think the best way to start would be to talk about uh, you mentioned in your introduction the longstanding relationship, uh, sister, sister city relationship between Shanghai and San Francisco. Uh, in fact, it's the first sister city relationship between China and the United States that was established more than 40 years ago. Um, and AmCham has always celebrated the commercial and cultural exchange between uh, the two cities. And there really is also a very strong uh, Bay Area, Shanghai, sort of Yangtze River Delta connection. Um, so the two cities, you know, have been sort of officially sister cities, but there really has been a, a longer relationship to that. Uh, and it really goes back to when Chinese immigrants first came to the United States. Their first stop, of course, was San Francisco. And, and Chinese hospital really was an important part of that, that history, providing needed medical care, uh, and basic healthcare service to Chinese immigrants in, in, in San Francisco starting back in 1899. Uh, it was often the only place that they could, they could get that. And I know that we're going to talk about that later. Um, and, and we know the whole story after that, the city, uh, the hospitals become one of the vital links for the city's healthcare system, not just San Francisco, but the Bay Area. 
Um, and, you know, we were really impressed at AmCham Shanghai uh, in the way that the hospital was really playing a, a, an important role in stemming uh, COVID in, in the Chinese community in San Francisco. Um, you know, and to answer your question, we first became aware of uh, of that through some of the media that the city, that the hospital was getting, the New York Times and KPIX and, and, and other things. So, you know, because AmCham really often serves as a platform to facilitate commerce between the U.S. and China, uh, and, and again, between the YRD and, and U.S. Western states, we really thought we could help. Uh, and when we reached out to our membership, we received a lot of interest in, in helping Chinese hospital, but also the whole, you know, U.S. healthcare system as, as they as they battle the, the COVID virus. And, and people really want to do something to help. Eric mentioned earlier, you know, typically uh, it, it's going the other direction. Right. So the U.S. is oftentimes helping or Americans or Chinese Americans or uh, uh, just regular people helping China deal with, you know, natural catastrophes like the earthquake in 2008. Uh, and, and other events. Uh, so I think this was seen as an opportunity uh, by lots of Chinese people uh, in Shanghai, but also our member companies uh, based in Shanghai and the Yangtze River Delta to, to give something back. Um, I, I'd also add here that uh, there really is a strong contingent of, I don't know if the best word to describe them as uh, ex-expats. Uh, they used to live in Shanghai, they're Americans, uh, but now they're back in the Bay Area. Uh, and I was a, a sort of a temporary member of that community, uh, having visited uh, California in Chinese New Year of 2020, uh, then found myself more or less stranded in the U.S. based on uh, China's uh, travel restrictions. So my family and I, we were in, in, in San Francisco for about a year. Uh, we just got back to Shanghai in, in December. Um, and I really got in touch with this sort of vibrant community, not just expats, but you know, the Chinese American community in San Francisco. And to be honest, I wasn't that familiar with the Chinese hospital. But again, once we saw what was happening, once we saw the role that Chinese hospital was playing uh, and we saw that COVID was really developing here in the U.S., uh, we knew there was something to do. And, and so we, we, you know, we entered into this sort of campaign with our membership. And, you know, uh, not only was 20,000 uh, surgical masks uh, provided to the hospital, but also $10,000 in, in contributions, which I understand was used to purchase surgical gowns. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a huge donation in terms of what was really needed, but we felt like it was a big first step uh, for, for our community in Shanghai to, to make, that, make that donation. Certainly, we know how, sh it, how those masks were in short supply. We saw mm. Just regular citizens try to buy them on Amazon at exorbitant yeah. costs. So twenty thousand is is no small number. I want to touch on the fact that you said that we're rarely in this reversed role where we need mm. help, and we certainly saw that for the first time. Do you remember any other time in your experience where the U.S. has been in this position? No, no. I mean, I've been in in Shanghai for about twelve years, and and this was definitely definitely a first. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for sharing uh, your sure. part in this operation. And now I want to bring in Dave Hartman into the conversation. Dave, you were promoted just this month to operations manager at Flexport.org. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So Flexport.org expedites free shipping of healthcare supplies for nonprofit organizations engaged in the battle against COVID-19. Dave, you were previously with Save the Children International. So tell us about this remarkable mission of Flexport.org and specifically your role in facilitating the free shipping of Chinese hospitals donated PPE from Shanghai to here in San Francisco. Certainly. Well, thank you so much, Betty. And uh, as everybody mentioned, thank you to the Commonwealth Club for having us here today. It is a true honor and great to share our story here. Um, so for a bit, bit of context, uh, Flexport.org is the corporate social responsibility wing of Flexport. And Flexport is a global freight forwarder. Uh, we're digitally enabled great freight forwarder. Uh, so essentially when you see those big steel containers on boats, on trains, uh, on the backs of trucks, and you see those big pallets being loaded into air into planes, uh, our company is one of the companies that helps manage all of that movement and making sure the cargo gets where it needs to go. Uh, and so my team specifically at Flexport.org, we manage not nonprofit, humanitarian, and social impact organizations. So we specifically focus on working uh, with hospitals like the Chinese Hospital, with nonprofits like MedShare, and other folks. So 
Uh, actually, about more than a year ago, back in January, we were already shipping things into Wuhan um, from a lot of number a number of great uh, U.S. based organizations. As Eric mentioned, uh, we saw the need there, and that was that was what we needed to do at that time. So uh, we used our capabilities, and we have a really large team in China. Uh, roughly, probably about a third of our organization is based in China, uh, between Shenzhen, Shanghai, Hong Kong, etc. Uh, so we were shipping things that way, and as the pandemic sort of shifted globally. We moved over to shipping things back into the U.S., into Europe, uh, and then out to the rest of the world from there. Um, so that just put us in a really good position because we understood exactly what was needed, where it was needed. Uh, and we knew exactly from, from folks like MedShare how we could get involved. So early on, we were actually procuring our own PPE because we had good contact with suppliers. And we had set up MedShare to be an importer of records. So basically, we got them on board with customs so they could actually import the cargo legally. Um, and by virtue of that, when MedShare heard about the issues with the Chinese hospital, they came to us and they heard about the donor. And they said, could we work together um, and use Flexport.org services to move the cargo from China into the U.S.? So um, there's a lot of complexity involved in terms of just picking up the cargo, customs difficulties and issues. Um, obviously, at that time, there were tons of regulations and they were changing pretty consistently uh, as the Chinese government was trying to make sure that only high quality PPE uh, and no counterfeit PPE or anything that was substandard was getting out of the country. So when it did get to the frontline healthcare workers, it was what was needed. Um, and so luckily we had a full team dedicated that we more or less seconded to the flexport.org team and said, you need to be working with us now. Um, this is where the need is greatest. Um, and then a lot of folks fighting for airspace. Uh, you can imagine uh, if everybody remembers and still knows uh, at that point, uh, all of the commercial, or excuse me, all of the passenger planes were grounded. And on those passenger planes is where roughly 40 to 50% of the world's cargo actually travels in the belly of those planes. So when all of those are grounded, there just isn't much capacity left to move cargo. Um, and you couple that with the fact that they had incredible demand for PPE, which is pretty volumetric. It takes up a lot of space. It was just very difficult to find capacity. Um, our senior leadership team saw this early on and said PPE is going to need to be a thing that we're going to move. So we procured a ton of space. We got with airlines and said we need space to move PPE. We're going to need this for at least the next six months. So we just had capacity. Um, and then once you do get things into the U.S., you still need to go through customs. You need to get it picked up from the airport and actually deliver it to Chinese hospitals. So um, hospitals across the U.S. So. Um, we just had this mass team on both ends of, of, of the Pacific um, that were really ready to go and, and understood what was going on. Um, and by virtue of great partners like MedShare, uh, it was pretty turnkey in how we could do this. We already had these great relationships. We already had uh, an understanding of what we needed to do on each end. Um, and we sort of just needed to flip the switch. Uh, and one of the really interesting things that we did see was that these partnerships expanded well beyond uh, just hospitals, nonprofits, and ourselves uh, with the corporate social responsibility wing. Um, a lot of our truckers got involved as well. And they came to us and said, hey, we see that this is PPE and it's going to a hospital. We want to move this on a discounted rate and we want our top uh, dispatchers and, and teams working on this. So we had folks like our teams in uh uh, in New York, a company called Five Star, who's a great trucker of ours in, in California, a company called uh, Rodex. And so both of them were saying, let us know when it's PPE. We're going to give you a discounted rate. We're going to prioritize this over any other cargo. Um, we've also seen airlines. Atlas Cargo is a great partner of ours who jumped in. Same thing with United Cargo. Um, United Airlines jumped in and said, hey, we want to be prioritizing PPE. We're going to give you space. We're going to prioritize this so we can get this moving. We understand the need here. So um, that's what our team focuses on. It's not just moving the cargo for the nonprofits. A large portion of it is looking at who else is in our network, uh, whether that's on the commercial side and some of the commercial clients that we ship for, or some of these truckers, these warehouses, the terminals, and letting them know you can be part of these 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 emergency responses and you can really do good here as well. So um, really just making sure that everybody understands that logistics is an incredibly powerful force. And if we really mobilize and work together and we really understand what the needs are, using the experts like Chinese Hospital and using the experts like MedShare, we can do really incredible things together. So um and then the, on, on top of that, we also had our Flexport.org fund. Um, so we launched a fund, um, which we already had going, but really hadn't raised too much money with it yet. But in March, we started to really raise money and said, this is going to be a huge need. 
there's going to be a lot of money that's going to be spent trying to ship PPE that nonprofits aren't going to be able to afford just due to these skyrocketing freight rates. Um, and so we launched this fund. We raised a few million dollars, almost $10 million um, from private individuals. Arnold Schwarzenegger got involved. He was instrumental in spreading the word, as was Ashton Kutcher. A large number of folks um, were really helping us get the word out. And that basically let us leverage our logistics capability for folks like MedShare, but then other projects as well, um, flipping over when we went to the international side um, and MedShare said, hey, we need to start getting PP to developing countries again. Then we had funds and we could basically turn key there as well and start moving funds to West Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera. Um, and so just really large term partnerships there um, that really allowed us to move PPE and food aid as well um, to the folks who needed it most. So uh, really inspiring. Um, but the, the crux of it was we had really great systems in place and we had really great partnerships in place um, and we trusted one another. So I knew when Eric and Jason came and said, hey, there's a partner who needs assistance. I knew, great, let's go ahead. We're going to execute on this and we can trust that they're going to they're going to be able to uh, really implement the work and vice versa. When we said, hey, we have a donor that can really help out MedShare. They said, great, let's get on the phone with them and we're going to go ahead and figure out ways we can move more PPE. So um, really just great work all around and really inspiring for us to be involved and find new ways to use logistics for good. Wow, Dave, thank you for outlining that. You know, logistics, as you said, very powerful, very complicated as well, mm -hmm. but you really show the power of partnerships. If you could just single out what was the greatest challenge in orchestrating all of that, what would you say? Ooh, that's a tough one because the challenges are many. There's just so many different steps uh, across the whole supply chain. Um, but one of them, I guess, was the, that changing complexity of customs regulations and then just the limited capacity. Um, consistently, our air planning team was coming to us and saying, we have 25 PPE shipments on this plane. Which one do we prioritize? We can only fit 20. Um, and so being able to go through the list and understand how can we get the most people as much PPE as they need um, and understand maybe we already delivered a large amount of PPE to this hospital yesterday. We don't need to get them this next batch immediately. So um, a lot of that is just, again, having really honest and candid conversations with folks and saying, is it okay if we put your next delivery off of hundred thousand masks two or three days? Um, and they say, yeah, you know, we actually, our warehouse is full. We can wait a week. Um, let somebody else get the PPE. So just making sure that all the folks are on the same page, everybody understands what's going on and really understanding that everybody's in the same fight. But if we work together, um, we can, we can beat COVID um, and, and do some really incredible things together. And you, and you certainly did. And democratizing the PPE is not easy. So <laughs> thank you so much, Dave, for, for sharing that. Jason Chernock, I want to bring you into the conversation. Jason serves as Director of Programs and Partnerships for MedShare, which we've been speaking about this evening. He focuses on building partnerships with the healthcare industry to advance MedShare's mission and oversees the organization's national gift-in-kind strategy. Jason joined MedShare in 2014. Jason, MedShare provided Chinese hospitals first PPE donation of 43,000 PPE the day after London Breed declared shelter in place, which I know we all recall. Metro then offered to broker PPE shipments to Chinese hospital by acting as an import export broker. So Jason, if you could tell us what role MedShare has played in this global pandemic and specifically how you'll continue to further these US-based partnerships with nonprofits, including Chinese hospital with their PPE and medical supply needs going forward. Jason. Sure. Thank you, Betty. And thank you for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be here and to see a lot of my colleagues that I've been working in the trenches with uh, for the past year. Uh, MedShare is a, a global humanitarian aid organization. We are a 501c3 nonprofit in the U.S., and as uh, Dave put so well, this is not our normal role. Normally, we are exporting international aid around the world. Uh, we always work with medical supplies, so that was something we're very familiar with. But normally, we are getting donations from hospitals in the U.S. Many, many hospitals in the Bay Area are our partners. Folks at Kaiser, Sutter, um, are regularly donating supplies to us. And then we're working with volunteers and logistics partners like Flexport to move them overseas. So this was taking that process and putting it in reverse. 
we had been responding to the COVID pandemic since the early days. Uh, along with some other NGOs, we were sending face masks and other PPE to Wuhan, to Shanghai, where the outbreak started, uh, in effect, to try and stop it from spreading elsewhere. But once we saw that the pandemic moved to the United States and our country became the epicenter of the outbreak, we felt like it was our responsibility to respond to that. We have benefited from uh, hundreds of healthcare organizations and companies in the U.S., and it was very much our honor to try and return um, some of that to them. Um, the Chinese uh, hospital in San Francisco and a number of other um, community health-based organizations were organizations that we were familiar with through our base in San Leandro and through our ongoing work in the community. Um, we were responding to everyone in that moment. It was all hands on deck. And I know, uh, and he was maybe, uh, didn't get around to saying this, but you know, Eric was driving the truck and delivering supplies. I mean, it was all hands on deck to make this work. And um, when we got a call from a community partner, we did everything in our power. We had some existing inventory that we could use, but it was really the partnership with Flexport that allowed us to quickly bring significant amounts of PPE into the U.S. And uh, Dave is correct. International logistics is complex and it's hard. And so when they said, we want you to be an importer of aid, uh, we had absolutely no idea what that meant. So they got us on board. Uh, we registered with the FDA. We went through training. Uh, we worked with their team and got all of our staff familiarized with what our role was going to be. We had some infrastructure that we could lend. We had some warehousing, we had staff, we had distribution channels, and we had a lot of trust in the community partners that we could reach out to. So we had no doubt that regardless of the volume of PPE that came in from China and elsewhere, we would be able to find a home for it. I do want to stress that we followed COVID wherever it led in the U S and globally. So we responded in the Bay area because that's where the need was the greatest at the time. But once COVID emerged in the Northeast, in New York, New Jersey, or in the Southeast, we started moving PPE to those areas as well. Uh, and Flexport was with us really every step of the way. Uh, we quickly moved 50,000 KN95 masks to several hospitals in New York and New Jersey. And we've just continued distributing that material across the United States since that point. We really haven't slowed down whatsoever. Uh, it's been a great partnership. Uh, we've all learned a lot from doing this. And I think it puts us in a position to continue supporting these community-based organizations, uh, continue supporting the Chinese hospital wherever their need may arise. And as COVID evolves, uh, and we uh, assess the need for PPE and ongoing testing and support, we'll be positioned to continue providing that, that aid. Thank you, Jason, for really exposing that this was not an easy mission to pull off here in the country, also across the Pacific. We talked about how this, is, this happened first with us helping China, and then we saw the reverse. Did you learn anything from that first leg of the mission that then you were able to apply when the U.S. Oh, needed help? Of course. Uh, you know, everyone wants the, the best possible material to get to the people who need it most, right? Whether that's in China or whether that's the United States, it's all about um, making sure that you're working with legitimate partners, legitimate manufacturers, distributors, uh, that you're getting high quality medical supplies to the people who really need it. And so you want to follow those shipments from start to end and make sure they get into the hands of the people who need it most. Uh, we did that in China and we did that in the United States and we kind of learned from both experiences. The other thing I want to uh, highlight um, is that at the very start of this, uh, MedShare received an outpouring of support from Chinese Americans, both in the Bay Area as well as in Atlanta, where our headquarters is. Um, people were coming to volunteer, they were coming to package PPE, um, and that support has continued. Um, all the college students that were in, in school at that time came 
and, and wanted to help get supplies wherever it was needed, whether it was going to China or whether it was going to the Bay Area, Atlanta, or anywhere else where we happened to be working. So that was uh, something we didn't expect, but we were delighted to see. And it just kind of goes to show you how much different communities have stepped up to support this. Yeah, and even on a personal level, I saw coworkers bringing in masks that were left over from the wildfires that we had here in California. And so you really touched on people just being heartened by what was happening and helping in whatever way they could um, on a small scale and then, of course, on a, on a grand scale, which you were involved Absolutely. in. Absolutely. So. People were sewing masks and dropping them off. People were getting them for wherever they could, you know, to be to a part of that solution. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing that with us. And Dr. Jan Zhang, I want to bring you into our conversation. Jan joined Chinese Hospital in 1994. She's been CEO since 2017. And your service throughout the Chinese hospital system began in 1994. Among numerous awards and certifications, Dr. Zhang has been a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. And last week, you were named a Distinguished Woman of the Year for the state of California by assembly member, David Chu. Congratulations. Thank you, Betty. I'm not done with your bio just yet though. Go ahead. <laughs> because you have many accomplishments. So before and during the pandemic, Chinese hospital has been widely acknowledged for having prevented a significant outbreak of COVID-19 here in San Francisco's Chinatown due to in part the assistance and involvement as we've seen from AmCham Shanghai, Flexport.org and MedShare International. Of course, national stories, including the New York Times, PBS NewsHour, and in several on-air appearances on my station, KPIX5, your achievements have been documented. So Dr. Zhang, please tell us how Chinese Hospital coped with this pandemic. You were ahead of the curve and your gratitude for all of these organizations who helped you pull it off. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I want to say this is a great uh, way uh, of a partnership. You know, really, I'm going to tell you later on why that you all helped me get my sleep, really seriously. And, and so apparently this pandemic is frightening, you know, for us uh, in, in the hospital. And it was, there's so many challenges uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, operationally and, and financially, especially when the uh, sh uh, shelter in place uh, order was uh, Im implemented, all the elective uh, uh, procedures were canceled. So we didn't have much income, right, as a hospital because we couldn't do any, anything. And so other than uh, helping the community, it's actually we had to do more in a community level to go out there to help the community. Everybody thought that, that the outbreak was going to be in Chinatown, right? And there's several reasons for that. San Francisco Chinatown, it's a... Uh, um, one of the areas that actually is the second most densely populated area in the nation. And, and I didn't even know that before this pandemic, by the way. I, I know that we're really crowded, but it was the second most densely populated area. Everybody thought that the, the pandemic was going to be in uh, 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 Chinatown, and we thought so too. So that's why we didn't wait. As soon as I heard about this pandemic in Wuhan, and then we had, uh, uh, David will tell you this too, because we have direct flights from Wuhan to San Francisco, 12 hours, right? So it really didn't take much for the virus to come to San Francisco. So we started in January, actually, that we started doing a lot of uh, our community outreach, a lot of education. And then uh, because we have a lot of SRO in uh, residents in San Francisco, I, for those of you that you have never been to an SRO, it really, it, it's, it's like terrible. I mean, like, I, I never knew that. I mean, I always heard of uh, SRO living condition, but I had, I had never been to one until the pandemic. So you, it could be 16 people uh, sharing one bathroom, share, share, uh, you know, sharing the kitchen. And so how can they 
keep the social distancing. There's no way, right? So then they have to take turns to cook. Think about it 24 hours. Uh, and then 16 people have to cook, right? Like in, in that one kitchen, small kitchen. So that's why that we, we first went there to, to educate them how to uh, clean the bathroom, how to clean the doorknobs, how to clean even the, the, the handles of the uh, uh, bathroom uh, um, flush. And so the kitchen uh, a counter and everything. Then we really started quickly uh, uh, put a, a together a proposal to get a grants to cover uh, a mobile unit so we can deploy if there's uh, uh, anything like it happened in the community, the testing, you know, later on that a lot of the contact tracing, all those things. Now those are all nightmares, but my biggest nightmare is actually PPE. Can you imagine that um, if our providers uh, 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 don't have PPE, then if they get sick, Who's going to take care of the, the, the community? Who's going to take care of our patients, right? So that was my, my biggest nightmare. And I started um, uh, older PPEs, actually told my purchasing department to order more N95. This is a back in January. Like a, I clearly remember it's a, a Chinese New Year Eve. And so it was a back order. That was a January 24th and 2020. Then there was that odor was a back odor. So this scared me so much. I'm like, oh my God, you know, this is more serious than we thought. And so I came from China originally. So I started talking to all our uh, vendors to, to see whether we can get more uh, PPE and couldn't, nobody could give me anything. So then so I started calling uh, China, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, overseas uh, departments and um, uh, there, there's other, other uh, uh, officials uh, there too and Chinese consulate. And that's when I find out that 50% of our PPE is actually manufactured in China and, and mostly in that uh, Wuhan area in the Hubei province. Uh, where that uh, COVID uh, impacted that area the most. I said, oh my God, this is bad. So... I literally at that time spent so much time calling, you know, uh, uh, China, Hong Kong and, and Taiwan, you know, trying to get help from all over and not a lot of responses. So I said creating a pathway to get PPE was really one of my uh, top priorities. And so this partnership really helped a lot. I, I mean, I, I, I can Thank you enough for, for, for doing this. Actually, because I couldn't sleep because I worry so much. The worst time that what I did, I, I, I started telling people early I didn't want to because it, it was scare the, the community, would scare my, my team too, was that I actually ordered myself a raincoat you know, when, when, but at that time. And then, so I'm a clinician, right? So I said, when it gets really bad, then if I need to actually roll up my sleeve to, to, to help out and a, a raincoat is a better than a garbage bag, right? Cause you, you see that people in China use a garbage bag and people in, 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 in uh, uh, Italy and in New York use a garbage get, uh, bag, right? To, to really, uh, uh, and, and that's how bad it was. And then I, we ordered 500 uh, uh, raincoats for, for, you know, just in case, you know, kind of like a really that for, for our providers. And so then we really uh, uh, kind of creating this pathway to get um, PPE from China. It, it really helped me get me the security, put it that way, a sense of security that at least when it gets bad, we, we, we can get a PPE. So I, I greatly appreciate, you know, all, all of you working together. It's a kind of like a creating this uh, partnership model. I can guarantee you this is not, this is just the beginning. And this pandemic, like, uh, um, you know, Eric said, it's just a one of the 20, right? And, and, and this is not going to be the last one. We will have more to come. It could be we helping other parts of the world or helping us, too. It could be either way. But this is very, very important. I am not going to let this go away. We are going to be partners of, 
uh, forever, and because it was really important to to us. And and yes, I'm really thankful to um, all of you and other uh, uh, supporters too, to Chinese Hospital. So as of today, and Chinatown community is still one of the areas with the uh, lowest infection rate. And so it's it's uh, it's a good. I mean, we need to. We're doing a lot more now at this point. We're giving out a lot of vaccines, uh, and we 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 need to reach the seventy percent of the uh, herd immunity rate, right? So we're doing a lot of testing, and so we're still helping uh, uh, the communities in whatever way we can. Thank you very very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. And I know that it's something to be incredibly proud of because everybody thought Chinatown would be a COVID hotspot in the beginning. I know Supervisor Aaron Peskin, whose district covers Chinatown, is incredibly proud of the work that you're doing and the fact that they have a very low number of COVID cases. I'm interested to know because you had so much foresight in the beginning. Did you get any pushback when you were preparing? Did anybody think you were overreacting? Oh yeah, yeah. People would, you know, at that point, and I think we didn't have any cases yet, right, at that time. So that's why I think uh, some people thought that oh, it's not gonna happen, like SARS, right? It it happened in China, not gonna get here. Some others were thinking that um, it, it it may, but uh, but we all thought that if it happens here, it would be in Chinatown because of mm-hmm. it's also Chinese New Year too at that time. A lot of people come in from China uh, uh, for this uh, for vacation, right? Because it's a long longest uh, uh, vacation in China, and also too though here we have a lot of residents uh, went back to China for for Chinese New Year, and they will come they will be coming back. So there are multiple factors. So that's why that we were really. Uh, uh, um, thinking uh, we will be the place if there's a, any any outbreak. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. I, I'll add that last year during the Super Bowl, I, re- I recall reporting on the first case here in Santa Clara County. So it's it's wild mm-hmm. to think where we are a year from now. I want to open this up for audience questions so that our panelists can have a chance to answer. So our first question is, how do the panelists see this model of help from public, private, and nonprofit groups reproduced across other challenges that we face? And feel free to jump in if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I'd love to take that one. It's a great question. Sure. Um, and so that, that is, that's essentially the model that flexport.org works with is, is this focus on public and private partnerships and understanding that uh, as, a, as a digital company and as, as a large logistics company, we have a really unique set of capabilities that nonprofits need. And so that's what flexport.org is. It just strictly focuses on how can we leverage that. Uh, and the, the unique part is we aren't a standalone CSR wing like you might see with some companies where we do our own thing and the rest of the company checks in once a year and says, how'd you guys do this year? Um, when we're moving freight, we need our trucking team to help us find truckers and they're going to help us find air capacity with, with, um, uh, with airlines, et cetera. So really the entire business is engaged and constantly sees this. Um, and that in order for them to be, be proud of that and really want to continue that work, we have to have quality partnerships with organizations like MedShare with the Chinese hospital. So when they do see that and they understand that this is something that they can get involved in, that they can support, it becomes pretty simple and straightforward. Um, and it goes back to what we mentioned before, which is really just leveraging our competencies and understanding what can MedShare do the best? What can Chinese hospital do the best? And what can Flexport do the best? And where do they align? And that when they do align, what essentially what we wind up having is the ability to just have an outsized impact over what one any of us could do individually. Um, and so when you do have organizations that are on the same page, there's really just this multiplicative factor um, that lets organizations do things that we couldn't do otherwise, because we don't have the same expertise. Um, but if we great, can develop great partnerships like we have here with all the folks in the line, um, we can really have experts in each field do their own thing and make that for the greater good. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to just leveraging this even more as we go down the line. I'm confident that you'll you'll be able to apply that to the next challenge that we face as as a, a globe, not even a nation. Hey, buddy, let me uh, jump in and yes, 
uh, address that from from MedShare's perspective as well. You know, uh, PPE is the foundation for all other healthcare that's being provided right now. So, in order to provide whether it's primary healthcare or OBGYN services, and giving people the confidence that they can be safe in accessing their care provider, you have to be able to have personal protective equipment. We've always supported charitable health care organizations in the Bay Area, uh, as well as around our other hubs. And of course, access to healthcare in the US is such a complex question, but there is a large national network of organizations that are trying to provide both primary care and specialty care to underserved populations every day. Those organizations can't do their job if we don't find a way to get them the basic tools they need. And while gloves and masks were always available before COVID came, it is now such a challenging commodity to get your hands on, especially if you are a a nonprofit charitable health organization and you're competing against larger healthcare hubs to get that, that we are already trying to serve them in a way that creates that ongoing access. I think this model can be applied to healthcare in the U.S., today, especially for underserved and underinsured individuals that are trying to access care right now. Thank you so much for that, Jason. I know many of us learned what PPE stood for during the pandemic, Mm -hmm. but certainly it will be a mainstay as we move forward. So we've reached the point in our program where we have time for just one more question, and I want all of you to have an opportunity to answer. So we'll begin with you, Eric. What can audience members do to help? Oh, thank you for asking, Benny. I feel it's really important to end with a call to action. Um, So I think I've been thinking about three things that I've done and I'll invite others to do and join me. Uh, First, actively listen to find ways that you can locally help advance health equity. For example, uh, MedShare hosts over 20,000 volunteers a year. Dave's been there. Jason's there to welcome you. We've got regular volunteers like Marsha and Audrey here in the Bay Area who welcome your help. The second thing, Again, if you, if you have the funds to do so, donate to community-based healthcare organizations like Chinese Hospital, help Dr. Zhang rest a little easier here and there, uh, and mm-hmm. appreciate her leadership and her courage and everything she's done. And then the third thing, and this one I would say, uh, you know, to piggyback off of Jason's comment, uh, you know, because change comes from us, not to us, is to support public policy that increases health equity. I mean, today is also the one-year anniversary of uh, – all 50 states having confirmed COVID cases. It's also by chance also, um, you know, the improved Medicare for all was reintroduced into Congress today. And even right here in California, there's a California Guaranteed Healthcare Act for all, AB 1400, also known as CalCare. So find out more and uh, get involved that way too. Thank you so much, Eric. David? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, what, one of the things that we often talk to people in, in the Bay Area, California, Western states, you know, AmCham Shanghai is actually setting up a West Coast initiative. We, work, we have an office uh, in coordination with San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. And, and I think, you know, don't get distracted uh, by some of the things that are being said and done at the national level. There is still a lot of commercial and cultural exchanges going on between China and the United States. And if you have an interest, uh, you know, this particular topic is a great way to get involved and engage with China. Um, I think as a result of our work with everybody on this call, um, some of our member companies have actually shifted to providing PPE, manufacturing PPE. We, we, uh, we had a lingerie company who now makes PPE. We had a, a drapes company who now makes PPE. Uh, I think that there's opportunities for U.S. companies in California who want to do business with China to do something similar, uh, whether it's bringing it here to 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 the United States uh, or whether it's getting involved in some of the um, uh, you know, fundraising activities for the hospital. Um, but there is a strong bridge between uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area and Shanghai. And I hope everybody will take a moment to take a look at that and, and maybe get involved to help. Thank you, David. Dave? Uh, I think David answers, David's answer is fantastic. Uh, I'm just going to piggyback off that, but figure out where your competency is uh, and figure out how you can leverage that competency. Um, when he mentions these, the, these apparel manufacturers switching, they're manufacturers and they're saying we can manufacture PPE for good. Um, if, if we can donate PPE, that's a great thing as well. 
Flexport and Flexport.org, we leverage our logistics capabilities. So find your competency, build great partnerships with organizations and figure out how your competency competency can benefit that organization and that cause. Um, and then just kind of rolling. You're not really learning anything new. Uh, you're just doing what you do best and going from there. Yeah. It's all it's all about knowing what you're good at, right? And connecting with people who are good at different things. I think you exactly. guys are all an example of that. Nothing wrong with staying in your lane, but you can expand the, what your lane is a little bit and uh, make sure that your lane is for good. So, Thanks, Dave. Jason? Well, there's, of course, a myriad of ways that you can support your local community. But I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, MedShare has a, a staff of 40 and 20,000 volunteers every year. We literally could not exist without them. They are our lifeblood to fulfilling our mission. And so uh, if you are watching in the Bay Area or if you're watching in Atlanta or in the New York metropolitan area, come into one of our facilities, volunteer some time, help us get these medical supplies to people who need them. Yeah, when you, you mentioned volunteer, it's one thing to donate to help these organizations further their mission, but also you can donate your own time. Absolutely, absolutely. Come to MedShire.org, sign up, and we'd love to see you. Did you see an increase in volunteers during the pandemic in this time of need? We certainly did. And I think that's true around all natural disasters or pandemic disasters. People do feel a calling to respond and they look for an opportunity to come in and serve. And I think we certainly saw that at the beginning. And then there was some hesitancy, of course, to come and be in a public area. But once we could provide a safe environment for people to come in and properly be social distanced, be protected, we saw a lot of those people come back in. Thank you so much, Jason. Dr. Zhang, your advice for anyone who would like to help? There are many ways they can help uh, uh, Chinese hospital or other community-based uh, hospitals, especially during the pandemic. And so like all of you uh, on this panel, so your expertise is different, but you are helping in very important roles. And so right now that we need the uh, volunteers and, uh, you know, to help us with the testing or the uh, uh, COVID clinics, the walking clinics that need a lot of people. And then for those of you financially, you can make a donation that definitely can help because there are many ways that the community would need at this point. Um, there are other things that you can do, there are many things that you can do. And uh, so Ian can help you with, the, it would tell you exactly what you can do to help at different uh, uh, points. And so thank you very, very much. And Dr. Zane, for our audience members watching who may not have a medical background or expertise, they can still, I'm sure, help the hospital in some way. What might be some ways that they could be of use? So, uh, yeah, like at this point, I just mentioned a, a volunteering. You don't have to be a doctor or a nurse to volunteer, right? Because you can help uh, coordinate the, 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 the clinics that help uh, to, to, to control traffic and all those. And there are many way, other ways that they can do, like help screening. By the way, we can vaccinate them too at this point. We want to make sure our volunteers are safe, right? Are protected too. And so they, and then uh, again, you know, if financially they can uh, make a donation that will be very helpful during the pandemic because we're providing a lot of free services to the community. And so uh, our, our COVID team has been helping the community uh, for over a year now. And then the COVID team kept expanding. And, you know, from like, just for example, our hotline, we start with two people there. And now we, at points of when there are a lot of calls, we, we expand it to six. Like, you know, really there are a lot of, uh, because we provide the bilingual services. So it's not just our patients calling, they're the communities, uh, uh, you know, ch uh, the monolingual Chinese are calling from Bay Area, even in, in other parts of the country they the call into because people are worried at this point and and and, and not just that because they've been staying home for so long and people are depressed with some mental issues too so we provide uh, a lot of online uh, uh, classes and and also um uh, psychological like uh, uh, counseling too because it, it's it's difficult for people 
Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And because we have a little bit of time, I know a lot of people are looking toward vaccinations um, ahead. Can you talk about how the hospital is helping to service the community on that front? Yes, so uh, Chinese Hospital has been working with the San Francisco DPH, and we have been giving out uh, 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 COVID vaccines to, uh, uh, we started with the uh, medical providers, right? And then we expanded to um, uh, seniors over 65 uh, and, and, and over 65 years old. And then now we actually expanded to um, 1C, which is uh, essential workers like uh, 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 firefighters, uh, police officers, uh, uh, teachers, and uh, um, um, uh, uh, food uh, uh, workers, like you know, rest restaurant workers, the grocery stores, all those uh, uh, essential workers. And then also to uh, already starting yesterday, we, we expanded to uh, 1C, uh, uh, anybody with medical conditions. Like, you know, or they live in congregated areas like, you know, uh, the SROs and, and some the, the qualified. So we, we, we are doing a lot of uh, vaccines and uh, to the community at all our clinics and hospitals and all the clinics. And we expand it to San Mateo County, too. And so, yeah, there are a lot of uh, a lot of sites that you can volunteer and um, we're working with elected officials like uh, the supervisor's office. So they're coming in to help out, too. And during the pandemic, we really see the community uh, working together. It, it really is the collective efforts of, of everybody right, uh, um, to help out that make our community safe. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang, showing really the power of coming together and the positive side of this pandemic. And to all of you, a big thanks to our panelists, Eric Talbert, David Des Basmijan, Dave Hartman, Jason Chernock, and Dr. Jan Zhang. We also like to thank all of our audience members who've been watching and submitting your questions. And the Commonwealth Club's Asia Pacific Air Affairs Forum, rather, will hold its next Good News Forum at four o'clock on Thursday, April 29th. The forum will explore the Micronesia Challenge and international partnership of governments, international non-government organizations like the Nature Conservancy and others to successfully conserve at least 30% of Micronesia, nearshore marine services, and 20% of land services. The program that you just watched and others like it will soon be posted on the club's website. And again, the website is www.commonwealthclub.org. Thank you all again for having me be a part of this special evening. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California and its 119th year of enlightened discussion is adjourned.